begin. Welcome everybody to How to Grow Your Law Firm, Two Success Stories. I'm Joshua Lennon. I'm the lawyer in residence at Clio. Uh, and as you probably heard on my live mic, I've been with Clio for six years, helping research the intersection of technology and the practice of law. And it's been my fortune to speak with a lot of great lawyers and law firms and learn from them what's really worked for them, what hasn't, and be able to share that knowledge with everybody here in the room and the greater Clio audience. And today, you get to share in that experience as well because we're very fortunate to have Tara Bird, who is the principal and founder of T Bird Law Group, which is one of my favorite names for a law firm right now, uh, Michael Morgan who, of Morgan and Cumbus, and unfortunately, his partner was supposed to be here, Jose Cumbus, uh, but had uh, just an issue that kept him from attending. Um, but we do want to recognize his contributions to today's presentation. And the reason we're speaking to these two particular firms is because they're both winners in this year's Reisman competition. So how many people saw the Reisman Award ceremony last night? Mm -hmm. oh. And so T-Bird and Morgan and Combus uh, were respectively brought up for best growth story and best new law firm. And what's really interesting about their submissions, I was one of the judges in reviewing them, was them talking about the stages and transformations that they have made along the way. And I really feel like this is the story you guys need to hear on both the highs and the lows of their last couple of years and why we can all work together and use these methods to create our own success. So thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Before we dive into the first question, I was hoping you could tell us just a little bit more about your individual law firms. Um, what do you practice? How are you set up currently? And then we'll go all the way back to the beginning to learn how you grew to that point. Tara? Okay, so Tara Bird, T. Bird Law Group. I do probate trust and business litigation, um, some estate planning and probate administration um, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And so I am a solo practitioner, but I definitely do not work alone. I am a contractor for um, other more experienced attorneys that are in 15 or 20 years of practice. And that's uh, kind of how I learn. Um, and additionally, I have contractors that are, you know, below me or equal to me, peers that work together on cases, whatever's like relevant to them. So a business litigator, if I'm in a business litigation, or um, I have virtual paralegals. And so um, I do have a team that I work with. They're just not you know, necessarily on the payroll. That's amazing. And Michael, can you tell us a little bit more? Yes, my name is Michael Morgan. Um, <clears throat> I'm a co-founder of Morgan & Kumbas. Uh, since I'm missing my better half in terms of my partner, uh, just wanted to give uh, an acknowledgement to him. I uh, also ask that you guys keep him in your, in your prayers. Uh, the reason he's not here, he was facing some health issues, um, which I'm definitely going to bring, if you guys didn't see that uh, presentation yesterday about stress, uh, I'm definitely going to bring those books back to him uh, because I know that that had uh, a lot to do with what he's facing right now. Uh, we do predominantly immigration. Uh, we could say crimmigration. We do some criminal defense, uh, but... For those of you who have not heard, Donald Trump is our president right now, and uh, immigration is a hot topic, and so we're staying very busy with that. Um, and we're just blessed to be here, uh, humbled to be uh, in a group uh, of, of individuals such as Tara. Uh, so we appreciate all of the uh, support, and I'm very happy to be here. So as we, we move to our first question, how do you define growth in your law firm? Um, how long has your law firm been operating, Tara? Uh, I am in my <clears throat> eighth year of practice. Yeah, as a solo so attorney. that's eight years. Wow. Seven, seven years, I yeah. guess. And Michael, how long has Morgan & Kumbas been in operation? We've been in operation for, we're about to approach our, our third, excuse me, three-year anniversary. Yeah. Uh, we, we started in a way that I would not recommend anyone else do. Um, I had $2,000 in the bank. Uh, Jose probably had about the same amount and significantly more debt. And we just started working out of a two-bedroom apartment, which if you have, had seen our video, it was my apartment. Uh, <laughs> it was great in terms of the fact that the commute was very short. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember that and I, I uh, spent a lot less money on gas those days because I would roll out of bed and the other side of the wall was an office, 
Uh, then suddenly, then we had to uh, put a, a desk in a living room. And I remember then Jose being moved, having his desk moved at one point uh, to the dining room table. Mm-hmm. But uh, we're nine strong now, uh, two and a half years later. I'm privileged to have our office manager, Luis Gomez, here. Uh, he was our number four person, and it was instrumental. That was the most difficult phase that we had in terms of our growth, getting over that hurdle. And Tara, how do you define growth for your law firm? Uh, growth for me is really more of a personal growth. I just want to be doing the, the pieces of the law that I like mm-hmm. and having everyone else do everything else for me. And in reading your recent submissions, um, one of the things that Michael focused on was the growth in the clients that you serve. So you started with, I think, 20 clients? Well, it, well, it starts with like, it starts with one, and then one become <laughs> then one become two. I mean, I was thrilled uh, just to have a few clients to start off with because we were concerned about: Are we going to actually be able to pay our bills, or am I going to file bankruptcy someday? Um, but we were super grateful that focusing on the interests of the clients, and it actually resonates with what uh, Jack said yesterday during his keynote when he's talking about something that we've missed in the gap in terms of the product uh, market, uh, I think he said, I think he, product market fit. Mm-hmm. We started with a focus on, we say, forget the money. The money will be a product that will come eventually. Obviously, you need money to be able to support an office and uh, support a staff. But if you focus always on the client and you think about the client's best interest, uh, if it is right for your client, then it will be right for your business. And then if it's right for your business, it'll be right for you individually. Uh, Money will then be the consequence, but not the drive of what it is that you're doing. And I think if you focus on that, that you will find that it pays dividends. And Tara, you mentioned that you had hit a milestone in your law firm in your recent application. What was that milestone? Uh, Well, similarly, I started uh, my practice like, you know, with lots of debt. Um, Basically, I had just finished law school, or sorry, got past the bar and finished law school. So I, I never worked for anyone else. Um, So I had no experience, and uh, I did not work out of my house, but only because another attorney took me in. His practice had crashed uh, during the market because he did construction, and so he gave me an office. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to pay for it, but I did have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Um, But it took a long time for my work to pay off because I was doing a lot of contingency cases, which is very hard because you have to wait. You almost Um, bankroll it, right? (laughs) Yeah, other other people were, uh, were doing most of the bankrolling, but I still was not getting actually paid for the work I was doing. Mm-hmm. So it just took a long time for that to actually pay off. And then when it finally did, then everything became easier. And also, as I became an older attorney, mm-hmm. um, I actually had the experience so that I was able to sell myself better and uh, know that I was more than just due diligence, which is still important, but I actually had experience. That's nice. So I think we've covered a little bit about this and what was your first step. But really, once you had made the commitment to open your own law firm, uh, you had a bedroom, you had an office space. What was, you sit down on that first day, what was your first step? Did you like, buy Google AdWords? Did you start speaking in the community? Mm-hmm. Um, how did you go about landing your first, your first client? So actually it was my Wells Fargo banker. Oh. Uh, I went to open an account because you need a trust account. And so he asked me to tell him about myself and I didn't even know how to answer that. And he goes, okay you need to learn how to talk to people about who you are, you know, your 30 second elevator pitch. And so he recommended an all women's networking group for me. Mm -hmm. So I went there and as part, if you're part of BNI, you kind of know how that works. You have to talk about yourself. It's like every week what I did changed. Um, And so, you know, actually having a practice area, that was a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But also I'm a quick learner. So I would meet with someone about QuickBooks and learn how to do my accounting. I would meet with somebody um, about you know online advertising, and they would help me with my website. And so I just I had more time than I had money, so I would invest a little in learning, and then I would do the work myself. It's a great way to frame it. Yeah, when you have more time than money, build the skills, yeah. and then those skills are applicable. Then once the clients start rolling in, absolutely. Yeah. And for Morgan and Compass, right. what was your first step? Our first step was finding someone to take a chance on us, and it was a political asylum case for a gentleman from Honduras. And we actually spent money to be able to take that case, so that $2,000 dipped uh, because we had to travel to go represent him. Uh, But we knew that if 
we could take that case and win that case. And we just saw something in this where we believe that he deserved to win. He deserved uh, to be in this country and he deserved uh, protection uh, from political persecution in Honduras. Mm -hmm. And we took it and we said, if, if we'd win this, um, talk about the work that we've done and spread the word to others because you'll know that we were actually honest and that we've invested money to be able to take care of you. Uh, after that, uh, and we fortunately did win that, we, we went to a lot of Mexican restaurants uh, <laughs> and we just continued to speak. No, it was, I'm serious, anywhere that uh, we had an opportunity to talk about uh, immigration because that's what we were focusing on. Anywhere we had an opportunity to give advice and tell people um, about their rights and about their options, uh, often in an informal setting, um, everywhere, anywhere, everywhere. It is, if you ever watch Shark Tank, Mark Cuban says you live and breathe your business. I mean, it was living and breathing it. That was all we were thinking about, how we can educate people about immigration uh, and spread that word and hopefully turn those people into clients. So I think one thing that we celebrate a lot are successful law firms, um, but they're not always overnight successes. Is there something that you guys tried that didn't work for you? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Employment law, personal injury law, transaction work. Um, I tried a lot of things. But um, I, now I have a bigger... Found. Yeah, now I have a bigger, better understanding of everything. So when somebody calls me, I'm able to direct them. And actually, one of my skill sets is my ability to do crossover work. Mm -hmm. So my, the majority of my crossover work is between civil and probate. Um, and trust litigation. So a lot of attorneys just do probate, a lot of attorneys just litigate, and they don't know what happens in the other courtroom. Um, and so I'm able to take on these complex matters that you know, sometimes involve eviction, sometimes there's family law issues. And so because of all my false starts, it makes me better at being able to uh, help the clients that I have now. I think that's a great lesson, thank you. And, and Michael, was there a sure. false start or an experiment that didn't turn out quite the way you Absolutely. wanted it to? And, and I'll put that on me, because it's my, I mean, Look to myself first. I feel like you have to always look to yourself first if you're looking at what is the problem and how do you find the solution is uh, be willing to accept responsibility. And one for me is thinking that the, it was actually an internal issue. It wasn't necessarily a client issue and it was as to how we're training people within the office. Uh, if you think of growth, I think of growth in terms of people within your organization as well. Uh, not just in numbers, but in terms of character, in terms of educating them. And the same method doesn't work for every person. Uh, you can't teach every single person the, through the Socratic method. Not everyone uh, learns under the pressure uh, or the sharp criticism. And turning within and recognizing that you have to mold also to the people and play to your, the strengths of the individuals within your org organization instead of trying to focus on their weaknesses. If you focus on their strengths, I think you will then help elevate them and turn those weaknesses into potentially strengths, or at least not as weak weaknesses. <laughs> One of the things that I think is interesting and difficult about running your own practice is, it seems like you're almost always starting from zero at some point, right? January 1, we're back to zero again. We've got to plan the whole new year, or I've got a new case, right? And in a contingency case, you're starting from zero from there. How do you set goals? What are those goals? Are they fiscal? Are they time-based? Um, and how do you go about then achieving those goals? I love setting goals. Mm -hmm. um, I love Clio for helping me set goals. Mm -hmm. I do set an annual goal, and when I set that, what I'm looking for is um, you know, kind of my minimum, my hourly, mm -hmm. uh, but I also track my productivity. So I do have that screen, the dashboard that I look at every day. Mm -hmm. I swear they didn't pay me for this. And I look at, you know, what have I done today? And if that number doesn't look good, what does the month look like? And if that doesn't look good, I'm going, okay, what did I actually do with my time this month? And, you know, sometimes that's because I was doing a bunch of probate work, which doesn't pay you until, you know, within the next year, mm -hmm. or I'm doing a contingency work, or maybe it's because I'm having fun at conferences, and then I need to make sure that, you know, that's going to pay it forward. So I do look both at time uh, and money to make sure that my actions are productive, even if the dollars didn't show up that day or month. Yep. And Michael, with employees, there's got to be pressure to make sure you're meeting goals as well in terms of supporting them. How, how do you handle kind of the planning around that and what are some goals that get you there? Absolutely. Uh, well, Kumbas and I actually take two different approaches. He uh, tends to look at things almost 
on a daily basis, so it presents a tremendous amount of stress when you're looking at, how did we do today? Um, it really, I look at a macro approach. So it is beneficial having uh, really, and that's a fine tooth micro, looking at what was our day today? What did we do today? What did we accomplish today? Uh, I look to the, the month or the quarter um, in, terms of, in terms of how I measure that, but being able to balance those two is, is something that we, we feed off each other so Tara mentioned using the, the practice performance dashboard in Clio. What tools are you looking at on a quarterly or daily basis sure. in this case? In this, in this case, what I'd look at, the way we matter, uh, number our cases has to do with uh, the number of cases we've had in that month. So mm -hmm. maybe a number would be 18, for example, right now would be 18-10- I think we're on case number 500 for the year, so it would then say 500. I look at it in terms of not a dollar amount, but an efficiency perspective as to how many people do we have in the office, what is our capacity. If our capacity is lower than it was before, that would tell me, all right, well, it's, if we have the right people, then it's a process issue and we need to have the information flow a different way within the organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. And Tara, you talked about using virtual paralegals, so that's a bit different than Michael's approach to staffing. Mm -hmm. Why do you bring in virtual paralegals and how do you use them to maintain your growth? Uh, well, my practice just varies um, because I don't take on the same type of case. I'm taking on a lot of diverse cases. And so, mm -hmm. you know, in litigation, sometimes you're really active. You're in discovery. You have documents coming in. You have motions happening. And you need help. And then those cases settle or they resolve. Uh, and then there's a lull. And so just because of the nature of the, the changing, um, I need to bring people on when I have a lot going on, and then I don't need to use them when um, I have different, different things happening. Okay, thank you. So I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how you use Clio, because I think that might be helpful as well. How does Clio help you grow your firm or meet your definition of growth? Uh, well, the dashboard, obviously. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of integrations. I'm integrated with QuickBooks, so in addition to seeing my productivity, I'm able to immediately see um, you know, the, the cash flow uh, mm -hmm. because of the way they work together. Um, I mean, there's, there's just so many. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Okay. We take a moment. We'll jump to Michael. We'll <laughs> come back then. So, Michael, do you find something particularly useful in Clio for helping with maintaining growth? Well, and, and it's actually for me, it's like, what is the focus? It goes back to serving the clients. And so I look at Clio and... I'm constantly looking to see what it is that we did during the day. For me, one of the tools that I use often is the firm feed, mm -hmm. um, where I can see what it is that people are working on. If I see what people are working on, then I might take, a, and again, a macro approach uh, as I'm looking at it to see perhaps there's something that I can assist you know, my colleagues with. Um, in terms of the case numbering, maybe if I'm going back to older cases, is there's constantly a task, okay? I say there, every, every single matter must have a task until that matter is closed. Uh, especially when you have, you know, there's 500 cases, there's nine people within the office. It's a scary thing when you think, especially some of our cases, I have hearings set. Uh, it is not a joke. I have some hearings set for 2022. Whoa. Uh, keeping track of those and knowing what happens in the interim, uh, looking at, um, you know, whether... Maintaining the contact with the individuals. Um, I thought it was telling Jack's statement yesterday about his, the data point and how clients want to receive updates. So if you look and you see that there hasn't been an update on a case, you're going through, you're just tracking again on a macro level, you look at it and you see there's nothing that has happened for a month or two, you might want to just pick up the phone and give your client a call. And when you give your client a call, they may tell you, hey, you know, whatever practice area you're in, uh, I also have a friend who, who needs help. I appreciate you giving me these updates. They also appreciate it coming from the lawyer. And we are, it's a bit, it's, it's a, a, a kind of a self-centered approach that requires some humbling when you look at what Jack was saying yesterday about the product market fit, that uh, perhaps we're not doing it the way we should be. I know that we want to sit behind our desk and get the work done or then go to court, but sometimes in terms of developing the business, it requires you as the lawyer to be there in front of your client. Um, I hear a judge down in South Texas Detention Center always say, the attorneys who visit their clients at jail make money. I mean, that's not the objective. You want to make sure they're informed. I think about it, imagine that you're 
you know, you're inside an elevator that closes, the lights go off, and you don't know when they're going to come back on. Because that actually happened to me one time when I was at uh, an, uh, an office before we decided to branch off on our own. And it was only 10 seconds, but the doors closed, <laughs> the lights went off, and I was, I just like, no, this is, this is what's going to happen. Um, I didn't know how long it was going to be before that door opened again. That's what your clients are in, in terms of, regardless of the legal field, they want to know when that light is going to turn on. And you give them a glimmer of hope by your call each time you call them and have that communication with them. Really like the, the calls to the 28 Legal Trends Report. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring a stat from the 2017 Legal Trends Report into this, where we found that the average attorney reported spending about a third of their day on business development. Is that in line with what your guys' practice feels like, seems like, or? Oh, it depends. I can spend, no. well, it depends on how you define business development. Okay. Uh, so one thing that I do, I, I'm volunteering a lot on various committees, mm -hmm. um, you know, hoping to effectuate change and bring education to people. And so you could call that volunteering, you could call that business development, yeah. um, because all of these speaking engagements, talking about what you do, I mean, that is the best way to meet people and develop business. Mm -hmm. So there's some times that I swear I spend like 100% of the day on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, maybe more like 50. Oh, wow. Okay. So for the solo lawyer, 50% of her day is spent on business development. For the partner? You know, oh. I, 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 that hasn't actually been, it's, it's unusual uh, to say that. It actually hasn't been our, our focus. It is, the focus has constantly been... And, and I guess this is a blessing, but the focus has constantly been doing as much work as we can to focus on the people that we have, the clients that we have. And mm -hmm. it's, it is something that needs to be done. And I think that it's, um, it's a, for us now, it's a process issue. That's something that we're here to develop. We've been focusing on the process. Uh, if you've ever seen the television show, The Prophet, he describes it as any business as three things, people, process, and product. Uh, I think that we have the right people. Well, maybe not Lewis, but with the exception of Lewis. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Lewis. We have, we, we have the right people. We absolutely 100% have the right people. Their hearts are in the right place. Their mission is aligned. Um, we're focusing on the process, though. And in that, then we'll be able to turn back in terms of the business development. Uh, but for us, that is a unique problem that we're facing right now. So you have a, a bit of a captive audience with Cleons in the room. What's one <laughs> thing that you want Cleo to do better to help you grow? I can say that with, <laughs> I've been talking about this for a year and I actually feel like a, a total nerd about the excitement that I had when I was taking pictures of those slides yesterday and I see Cleo and uh, Lexicata merged or Cleo acquired Lexicata mm -hmm. and with total excitement. That is the one thing that I've been waiting for forever. Uh, because for us, we have about, we, people are calling us, and it, whether it's a current client or a potential client, that we have, I would say, an, an average about 250 phone calls coming into the office per day. Wow. So keeping track of those and that data is something that is important. Um, I want to know if I've actually spoken with you before. There's no way to remember 250 calls per day for even just a week. Um, so we now have the ability to track that, and I think that Clio Grow is super exciting. That's great news. I'm really glad that that picture is. <laughs> How about for you? What's one thing Clio can do better? Well, I thought I was overwhelmed with like six potential calls a day, 250. Yeah. It's impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I also am super excited about the integration, um, but you know, the task thing. I'm sure there's a whole slew of emails that I've sent to Clio about better task functionality. Um, because like Michael said, I want to know like, what needs to get done. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm doing all the managing and handling all the cases, like for myself, I need to be able to track what has to come next. Okay. And right. I know which contractor has the work out as well. Then I know what we're going to announce in 2019. We're going to improve task. Absolutely, yes. So that's the end of my questions for Tara and Michael. But we wanted to leave a little time for questions from the audience. Do you have questions about growth strategies? Uh, things that you've heard today or ideas that you've been toying with and wouldn't mind uh, a kind of an expert's opinion on? I'm going to put you in the expert spot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have a microphone for someone who'd like to ask a question. Yep. Hi. Um, I have a, a firm of five attorneys, and we're at a point where we're considering hiring an office manager because I spend a significant amount of my time doing admin work. And you mentioned you have an office manager. And so if maybe you could give us a, some insight about what you did before 
you had one right. and how your life has changed after and what does that office manager do? Absolutely. Well, good questions. Thank you. That is a good question. And I'll tell you that was the failure. I call it the number four. I refer to it, I continue to remember it as the number four because I think we went through, and this is our fourth person. The stage of ours, it was my partner and I working and we were taking our own calls for approximately three months. Then it became an assistant that came on. The number four was the hardest thing because the process then flowed differently. Not everyone is necessarily going to be aware of everything that is happening in the office at a given time. Not everyone is necessarily gonna be aware of any particular client. For us, we had a choice. Did we wanna go pick an office manager who was incredibly tech savvy and was on the, the tech, you know, just on the technology side or did we wanna pull someone who had experience on the immigration side? So Lewis has worked in uh, a number of different immigration offices, both large and small, and he also is a former ICE agent. Uh, he was an ICE supervisor. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go the path of taking someone with understanding uh, in terms of the legal understanding. Um, what he does, I invite you, he's wearing the blue shirt right there. I'll, well, I invite you, mind, you to ask him. Do you mind raising him. your hand real quick? <laughs> uh, thank you. No. Uh, and so, yeah, here, we can chat with him afterwards if you want to learn more. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he would be happy to, and if he wouldn't be happy to, well, now he's pressured to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. How about another question, please? Do we have solo attorneys in the room? Yeah? What's one thing that Tara said that's actually worked for you guys? Who does public speaking? Oh, we've got, yeah, do you mind telling, it's Bernadette, right? Yeah, do you do public speaking? I do. Yeah, how do you go about finding public speaking opportunities? Um, they kind of come to me, I'm very involved in my community as mm -hmm. well. Uh, Tara and I actually sit on a board of uh, an attorney bar in San Diego. Yeah. And I was one of the founders of that. And I've also represented some nonprofits. So fortunately for me, I do not actually do any marketing. All of my um, practice is referral based, which mm -hmm. is great for me. Most of the time, my clients know me. They know something about me. And I know a little bit about them. Sometimes I'll get a referral of someone I have absolutely no idea, no connection, mm -hmm. anything, and then we just get to know each other. But um, yeah, that's, that's primarily, I guess, how I get my clients as well, through being active in the communities that I'm in, and uh, you know, just everyone knows I'm the lawyer, and you know, they're always, oh, call me, and all that good stuff, so. And how many people have thought about using freelance or virtual staffing in their law firm? Show of hands. And how many people are actually say, yeah, yeah. doing it? Show of hands. We've got Tara. All right, so uh, gentleman here in the front, what's stopping you from using virtual staffing? Uh, nothing's stopping me at all. I actually just uh, signed up with law clerk outside. And oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah. And how do you go about finding your virtual paralegals? Do you have one that you work with constantly or bring more on? Um, I have one now that I, uh, was referred to me who uh, was an expert in probate. She worked for a very, very reputable firm, and mm -hmm. so she was able to bring her knowledge of processes to me and therefore improve my processes. How virtual is she? Like, does she work within the state? Yes, or? she okay. works within the state, yeah. um, but she's not in my office. She never comes to my office. I've met her in person one time. Mm -hmm. um, so she's, she's very virtual, but she has a huge knowledge base of her own. And do you bill that time back to the clients, her time back? When possible, I do bill her out. Um, yeah. she's like, she has 20 years experience at least, so I'm able to bill her out on hourly cases, and uh, if they're not, then I, I have to absorb the cost. Okay, perfect, thank you. And I believe we have time for one more question. Hey, I have a, um, a comment or a, a hint, sorry, as it's coming through. My name's Catherine, and I'm a bookkeeper, and my clients are law firms. Okay. And one of the number one things that I recommend to my clients, because uh, I don't just do the books, but I help them transform uh, <clears throat> to become more efficient, more effective. Do you hold the mic just a little closer, please? So I, I uh, in addition to doing the books, I also help transform my clients to becoming much more productive, efficient, and profitable. Mm -hmm. And one of the number one tips that I can recommend to the room is becoming routinized, um, okay. having a standard process in which they either approach work, schedule time to work on the business, and then also for your billing. Um, Okay. Billing shouldn't be creative. It shouldn't be something that you reinvent each month, how to go about it, whether you're doing it or whether you have outsourced staff that does it. Um, 
it, this should be something that's standardized. That's perfect, yeah, and that's the prime use for activity categories in Clio is to standardize billing entries, uh, and then you have your own process for how you release it is what we, we teach people. Uh, we've got just a few more seconds. Why don't we grab one more? Hi, really quick for Tamara. How did you find your virtual paralegal? Uh, referral, referral based. I asked around in my community. I said, this is my need. We have in San Diego, we have some great listservs um, and really just a great legal community. And so I said, I need help and I received it. Okay, thank you. Nice, and that was through the San Diego County Bar or? Our County Bar Association has, yeah. a, has a very active listserv. They're really active. I've enjoyed working with them. So I want to thank Tara and Michael and Jose in absentia for coming up and sharing your story. And if we could give them a round of applause for celebrating their success. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.